and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. In the red corner, the the design, the one half of one half of the double-headed monster creating this this module known as in service to the tiger, the man best known as Corey Papa Papa Stathis. I'm pretty sure a lot of people screw up that name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, and on and in the blue corner we have James McElroy. They are the double-headed monster of Chrysalis Endeavors. How are you two doing today? Good, good. Doing great, thanks. So, one of the traditions around here, aside from the rampant drinking, is the is um the humble beginnings of sorts. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to uh, um, role playing games and. What made it stick? Um, all right, I, I can go first with that. My my first introduction to role play games was uh, when I was probably about thirteen years old, um, uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons uh, at a a school group. Of course, this was back when you know if if you've if you've seen some of the. Um, Stranger Things, you know that during the 80s that there was uh, a lot of uh, w weirdness about Dungeons and Dragons um, and uh, a lot of religious uh, push against it. So we, we switched over so that we didn't have to deal with that in the South and started playing um, the Marvel uh, roleplay game, which was, was horrible. It's a D100 system, and it was uh, basically spreadsheet the role-playing game because you had to roll so many tables to do anything. I um, I will slightly disagree with it being spreadsheet the role-playing game because <laughs> Phoenix Command exists. <laughs> right. Well, a, a lot of those early role-play games had tables and tables and tables of stuff uh, to roll dice on. Um, but that was, that was kind of where I got started, and then uh, Steve Jackson Games uh, offered our game store um, playtests stuff so we we started just play testing GURPS and uh so you know when I was I would say about 15 16 years old the first time I got my name in a book with GURPS horror and GURPS martial arts second edition mm -hmm. so um and I was hooked it, that you ask what got me hooked and that was it is is people being involved in and in kind of asking for feedback and asking what I thought about their games and there, I've been doing it ever since there's a bit of irony that you ended up oh uh, that you had that you had suffered so much when it came to spreadsheets in in Marvel Phase Rip, and then you move into the game that requires calculus for 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 managing character points. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, mean, I like GURPS, but I help, but I hold true to one to one particular rule rule in my temple: all men are create are cremated equal. Well, on that note, I guess I'll go next. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I also started in, in the school days. Uh, I think I remember playing, and I don't remember if this is the actual name of it, but it was basically a Lord, in the, Lord of the Rings like trading card game back in the early 80s. Uh, and then moved into Dungeons & Dragons... Or eight advanced Dungeons and Dragons, actually, I guess, uh, in the in the lunch room right before uh, same thing Corey mentioned with the the whole religious kickback against D and D, um, and then after that I didn't play for a few years, and then I picked it back up when I was uh, at the end of high school, early college, uh, and have been playing ever since. So for the last. Um, 25 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And 
with now with that in with that in mind, were I was gonna ask if you guys were one si were one system lifers, but given the GURP story, I think I shot that down <laughs> that question. <laughs> oh. Nope. Well, I play any game that's fun. Um. Well, I'm guess. Well, I'm guessing you probably you probably played a bit of Paranoia, but that's fun. That's fun for. That fun is um, subjective. Yeah, I, I actually uh, have run Paranoia at. Uh, I, I have a a Paranoia escape room module uh, that I wrote um, that it isn't published anywhere. I just run it at conventions because I, I think it's interesting to say, take the most competitive role play game there is uh, out there and force people to try to be collaborative and find their way out of an escape room and it, it just it, it, it's it's hilarious with all the secret missions and everything uh and everybody's you know um trying to make it out of this escape room and trying to share knowledge but not share too much if you know what i mean mm -hmm. but the thing one thing that I'm one thing that I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about in the in in this re in this regard is um whenever I think whenever a whenever a lot of um a lot of a lot of folks talk about about doing um feudal Japan in ta in tabletop or something yeah. equi something equivalent there's a short list of names that gets brought up obviously L5R is one of the big one of the bigger ones um yep but sometimes I'll hear people bring up the Oriental Adventures book from the eight from A D and D, uh, or if they're or if they're really desperate, the the Bushido game from Fantasy Games Unlimited, which um, I've yet to see anybody nostalgic for anything that came out of Fantasy Games Unlimited. Chart hell yeah, is what I I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so, the we we uh, we explored a couple of different systems before landing on just doing OGL for Five E, um, and I think that the the reason uh, we we definitely didn't want to write our own system. Um, we wanted to take something people were familiar with and kind of uh, base base our story uh, around that. Um, so that people could just kind of jump into the story without learning a whole rule set, and um, we do we do have. I mean, it's it's there's no classes in because uh, it, it's all made with pre-gen characters, so there's no classes. You just pick which character you want to play, and then they quote level up through uh, a, a system that we designed to do take whatever it is that they the choices that they make actually give them bonuses and make those characters uh the custom character development process uh that we kind of put into each character uh and as we were as we were talking about stretch goals for example we were like how do we want to do we want to add a, a a seventh character as an option as a stretch goal and then we remembered how much work it was to do uh, just to do the six just to do the six characters that are included so mm -hmm. Now that bring that brings me to in to um in service of the tiger. Before we before we even get into get into the subject matter, um, what made you what what made you want to go with, um, the tigers of Kai, as the ba as the basis? Well, James, you want to handle that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this all started basically where I had put together a solo adventure for Corey based in the feudal era of Japan in, in the Warring States period. Um, and, I mean, the Warring States period, you know, it was a couple hundred years, but it, things really started to get exciting in the last 50 or so, um, starting with Takeda Shingen's push into Shinano. Mm -hmm. um, that's when things start to accelerate. And so I started that solo adventure there uh, and then kind of went all the way through um, oh, 1610 or something like that. So 1550 to 1610, about 60 years 
um, of of history, mainly to make it kind of a cool historical adventure for Corey. And so when we discussed, let's could we turn some of this into an actual adventure, flesh it out, make it fun to play for more than just you know Corey. Uh, we decided to just start at the start, and so uh, Takeda Shingen was the first daimyo that we tackled, and uh, so we just started with the start of his Shinano campaign. Mm-hmm. And one thing that one thing that's always that's always a bit always a bit of a question whenever you're dealing with historical fiction or even introducing a whole new a whole new setting is making sure that there isn't continuity lockout and while that isn't as much of an issue here um, there is st- there is still the possibility that a table running this might not be as fam- might not be as familiar as you guys are when it comes to Japanese history absolutely so- yeah uh, I mean that's that's a that's a real challenge that we that we looked at right and we we spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out a way to introduce people into both the time period as well as the area and and a little bit of the culture um, right off the bat uh, at the, at the t- to really help people just jump into the adventure but now if somebody's never heard of the country of Japan even that's probably not going to be enough, but we're assuming a base level of knowledge of where the country is, that, hey, there were, you know, samurai, and, uh, and you know, mythically, there were ninja, and, you know, they had all this stuff going on, you know, there's an assumed level of kind of base school knowledge that, uh, as long as you have that, you should be able to, to, to come in and play this and, and really enjoy yourself. And then, you know, mechanically, we did add uh, some cards into the mix um, where, you know, at, at some key points in the storyline, uh, we have these kind of like role play assist cards, basically, where uh, we hand these out as, as you read the box text for this big event. And it uh, gives each of the six characters some things to think about. And, and we found during playtesting that people really enjoyed that because... Um, it, there, there's definitely a different perspective about some of these things than there would be in Western culture. And having those kind of bullet points, you could do this, or you could do that, or you could do this, or you could come up with something of your own. But it gives them some, uh, basically, a, a, an idea of what this character in history might be thinking about. Uh, and and our playtester just loved that. Even if they didn't go with anything on the card, they loved having the context um kind of handed to them when these big events happened. Yeah. Now, you guys made you guys made an interesting move in the sense that you're using a set of pregens instead of it being, oh, this is an adventure for characters of of X level. Right. And I'd like to I'd like to get where what brought you to that decision. I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier with, you know, uh, y- y- if you allow people to create their own characters, and, and it's not that they can't create their own characters, it's just it, the the story goes so much better, and we wound the story around these six people, so you get to experience being one of these people. Um, uh, it would be harder for a GM to allow anybody to just create their own samurai and bring it in, uh, in because so much of the the written adventure is about these people. Um, and the reason we wanted to do that is because we didn't want to lock them out of experiencing history, because that was really the goal. It was really about how can we get people to experience this part of history. Um, and, and I think Pregians just kind of made it the way to go, because um, we could then give different perspectives around uh, what's happening in the story. You know, whether that's a uh, samurai perspective, whether that's a... or, or a, a higher level samurai perspective or a lower level... Uh, lower. When I say level, I mean uh, uh, Koku... Um, help me out here, James. The social so there, level. There was like, yeah, there were like 21 different classes of samurai... And so if you were a low-level samurai, you might not only make enough rice to support 
you know you and maybe one other person a year sort of thing because they were paid in rice right and and they were paid in a, in a measure of rice called the koku which is enough to serve a, you know uh, satisfy a person in rice for a year basically um and some of the high level samurais they might make enough to support a hundred people um but they didn't usually deal in money And so, of course, even though they're all in the samurai class, right, their their social status is drastically different depending on how much rice they make. Um, and so we tried to to bring that into the, the adventure as well to as part of kind of the cultural context that some of these characters are playing in. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, the result. You also have a me- a meth a method of progression that is not exactly standard. I'd like you to go into that, how it would work, and what your goals were in the context of this story that you're telling. Sure, I'll start that one off and then kick it over to to James. So, yeah, the the leveling up, so to speak. Um, we we kind of threw that out the window, and we we took the different things that could happen, and we tried to assign uh, character progression to them. So, uh, and I think that there one of the one of the um, pages, one of the like demo pages that's on the Kickstarter uh, shows um, Akiori, and he has like these different things he can do. Uh, to deal with waking up in the middle of the night and thinking about uh, this this person that he's infatuated with. Um, and there's different role play choices. And based on what they choose, uh, that, that helps them gain stats. It helps them, uh, you know, having different skill traits, uh, in some cases, different um, special abilities. And, and we kind of broke the mold on that with some of the characters. We were like, okay, well, if they go this route, we're going to give them rage, even though there isn't, you know, there isn't really a barbarian class. We're going to give them, like, because they made this choice, now they get rage. Uh, and then maybe they make this other choice and they don't get rage, but they get some sort of uh, command ability or something like that. So that that's kind of where, how we base the character progression. Um, and I'll, I'll kick it over to James to kind of talk about the process we took, you know, with the spreadsheets and everything, trying to figure out what that looked like. Right. I mean, we basically put ourselves through spreadsheet hell, um, where we had, you know, we, we figured out kind of how many different major decision points we wanted to put in front of the characters in order to help them progress as characters um, in exchange for, you know, doing leveling up and stuff like that. And then we set up, set out a matrix and we said, all right, now we need to figure out how, you know, what are the what we try to do is give three or four kind of predetermined choices for each of these decision points, plus the do whatever you want decision point. Um, and then we had to figure out what those outcomes would be. And like Corey said, sometimes it might be like you get an ability. Sometimes it might be your stats go up, or you get a you know this cool skill, or maybe you get uh, an an item, right, or or something like that. Uh, and you know, with any of those, we tried to include flavor text as well as, if applicable, uh, historical, you know, notes about it. And you know, these tie into the the cards that Corey mentioned, right? Each each of these decision points will result in the character getting a, a character progression card that tells them how their character has been enhanced. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was it was a lot of work, and we spent a lot of time discussing, like, you know, what would how would this you know play with this character if they chose this way and you know what would and and sure we could give him this but does that actually would somebody be excited to get this or would they be like oh i made the wrong choice you know yeah, um, yeah that was the hardest part yeah. <laughs> now one thing that I, one thing that's always tricky when when having people play with a a bunch of pregens is making sure that the player can get can um have can have their own input Otherwise, otherwise you're uh, you're railroading, or you're being the um, TSR Indiana Jones. Um, how do you make how do you make sure that people will, st- even when they're pl- even when they're using pregens, 
are still going to be able to put in their personal stamp throughout the story. So that that goes back, I think, to the the way that we do the character introductions. We don't. Everybody doesn't just meet in a bar, you know. Uh, the, every every uh, each one of the pregens has its own um, vignette at the beginning that we say, "Here's what's going on with you," and then they get to choose how you know how they want that character uh, to kind of the inception of that character they get to be a part of um whereas it's not like hey you guys are all together and this is what's going on no we actually built into the adventure some time in which everybody gets their five ten minutes of getting to know their own character before bringing the party together and i think that gives them uh the chance to put their own flavor on that character um yeah, and, I, I like to think of it as less being John Malkovich and more Quantum Leap. <laughs> like, like instead of just, you know, writing on this character and, oh, well, I guess this is what they're doing now. That's boring. It's, oh, I am this guy now. Who am I? Uh, and what's his life look like? And how do I, how, how do I be this guy without just, like, destroying his life, right? I mean, it's it's more like that. It's like, how do I play this this person, you know, and, okay, this is what their motivations are. Do I agree with that? If not, I'm going to play them some, some different way, right? It, and that was the really interesting in the playtesting. Some people took their characters completely opposite the previous playtesters. Mm-hmm. Now, with, the, with, that in, with that in mind... Uh, I'd also I'd also saw the hand the handouts as well as the mini comics that were in the preview documents. Mm-hmm. Um, when it co- is that is that the ones that were shown is that the is that the outlier is that kind of the direction that those sort of handouts will go throughout the story? No, that that's kind of how it goes throughout the story, and uh, yeah, I'm actually. This this weekend, uh, heading out to uh, visit James out west to kind of w- figure out, okay, well, this is how much artwork we have funded. Where are we going to put it, and how are we going to to weave it in? Because uh, I think artwork was one of those pieces that we were, you know, we're really hoping that uh, it, it, we hit a bunch of stretch goals and and could kind of double the artwork basically in the book. Um, we may not be able to do that due to funding, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it's looking to be. Um, uh, absolutely, the all that, the... that it hasn't. We haven't had layout done yet, right? So yes, we're planning on keeping the artwork the way it is, but the layout of the page and where the box text and stuff that will likely change. It, it'll probably look a lot better than those uh, those demo <laughs> demo pages that are at the Kickstarters because we're hoping to, that the the layout person does a a uh, better job than yours truly here. Now, <laughs> well, look, look, confession is good for the soul, but in a lot of in a lot of the times that I that I've run campaigns, whenever I do a session zero, I always give out a primer, and within that primer, usually contains things like what sort, obviously, what game was getting played because I play a lot of different games, um, what. T- what tier we're playing at? What the um, narrative expectations are going to be? I.e., don't I.e. don't play certain archetypes if you don't want if you don't want to be the third wheel in this campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, if if I were to if I were to write a primer in and I'm um, running in service of the tiger, what sort of bullet points do you think would be important to hi- important to highlight for a table? Um, I I would definitely say that the I don't I don't know I that's a that's a hard one I I think that some of those bullet points might be um, the the other players or the other characters uh, are you you have to find a way to make other the other characters goals work. Uh, I would put that on there. Uh, be 
how would I phrase that? If it, I would probably say be a uh, a, a, a generous um, companion, a gener because in, at many tables, and I, and I've kind of on some of our on uh, some of the shows that that I've hosted, uh, like Tavern Talks and 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 with uh, the other James, not this James, but the James from Tabletop Misfits. Um, we talk about twenty percent my story, eighty percent everybody else's. Meaning, if you're you're telling a collaborative story with a bunch of other people around a table, try to make twenty percent of your time focused on your own story, and the rest of the time, the other eighty percent, how can I help other people tell their story? And if everybody does that, I. Uh, I think that, and that go, kind of goes without saying, with at any table, not just in, in our adventure, uh, but especially in our adventure when you don't, when you, the the background is kind of alien to you, and uh, everybody's kind of learning this culture themselves at the same time. Uh, I would say that being generous would be that thing. Also, um, that honor is real. Honor is tangible in this campaign. It is a thing. It is part of the culture. It is not something that, you know, uh, oh, well, I can do this. Yeah, it's not like an, it's not like I'm chaotic neutral so I can do whatever I want. It's, no, honor is real. Your family values are real. And the constructs that hold this uh, um, culture together, even though they're at war, and there's a lot of war, and there's a lot of combat, and there's a lot of things going on to uh, where, you know, daimyos are taking over other other areas of the country there is an honor to it there is a uh a way things are done and i think that that those those pieces would be what i would put on that those bullet points um i don't know i'll kick it over to james maybe he has some other ideas well i was just gonna add to that um that you know like you you kind of alluded to earlier, a lot of adventures start off with everybody meeting in a bar, right? Or you just run into each other in the city. In th this adventure, because they are pre-gen characters, they all know each other, right? They're, they're all familiar with each other. Some of them have been, have been raised together. So it, I, I would you know, put out to the table that you, you guys are a team, right? And sure, maybe you've had some frictions over the years or whatever, but you, you as opposed to some campaigns I've played where you know people are just kind of doing their own thing right mm -hmm. and you know you know crawling along trying to get the best loot themselves in this adventure you're all you're all in it together um, and the adventure really you know kind of brings that to the forefront and so like Corey said it, it should be how can how can we do this adventure not mm -hmm. How can I stand out and do something really awesome? Yeah. And truth be told, I could be this. I could be a smartass and say that instead of you all meet at a tavern, you all meet at a tea house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, but, e but even with even with that, I'm get. I'm guessing. I'm guessing that within the that within the book there will be some there will be some asides regarding um, eti etiquette to keep things to keep that particular aspect relatively in setting. Yeah, and I think that that's the the role play cards help with that as well because it it really does. You know, when you get that card, this big event happens. You get that card, and you're in. You know it it helps you think about the context of like i was saying that honor that family those those pieces of the culture are weaved into the options on the card so even if you don't take any of them you've got some experience to go okay now i'm looking at this and i see a little bit more i get a little bit more insight into the culture my character my family um you know the 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 daimyo that I serve and, and kind of these things become apparent and then it's opened up to okay so now how do we tell the story and in some of those cases those this big event happens and on you know player one's card and on player three's card they are different perspectives and 
I, it's been a joy to watch those players uh, tackle that, you know, tackle those differences as they try to decide as a team what to do. Yeah. Well, since you meant since you mentioned it, let's go into that. Let's talk about the role play cards and what prompted their creation and what you plan on doing with them. Well, that was a stroke of genius on Corey's part. Um, we were really struggling with how we were going to do advancement and if we were going to have like level points or like points in the adventure when we would have characters level up or what, because we didn't really want to deal with a bunch of experience for encounters and stuff like that. Uh, and then Corey had the idea to use cards as advancement mechanisms, and we I thought that was amazing, so we just went, we ran with it. And, and I, I also wanted to... I, I'm a, a big fan of when I run a game. I want uh, to throughout throughout the game and this to kind of pepper in what I call player gifts, um, it, which is, you know, sometimes... And these are usually more intrinsic gifts to the player that then they get it and they go, oh, this is something I can build on. This is something I can own. Uh, not... Well, here's a new sword. Here's a plus three sword. Here's a plus four sword. With the more extrinsic, you know, candy type gifts, I, I think of it as a, a a little plot point, a little thing that they get to unwrap and they get to go. Oh, this is nice. I know. I know exactly how I'm going to add this to the character uh, that I'm that I'm playing. And I think that those cards they also helped me uh, as we were writing it. Um, they helped me kind of have these places for each character to really shine and um and to me that's that's how it it, it really helps um and it, it kind of flashed you know in my in my head i'm thinking of you know telling stories together and everybody having kind of their cue cards is is kind of how i thought about it but then it became more mechanical and uh, more rich than just a here's your bullet points for you to do your part. It was more like here is a a way to understand your character and have some options. Um, and those options really helped us kind of uh, flush out the, a very character driven um, adventure. And I think we had to do it that way because otherwise, the the previous point you brought up about it being very railroady would have uh it would have been like well you can't change this this is what you have to do um and i and i think we got away from that i think we gave the players a lot of ways to not be railroaded uh make you know decisions that matter that that are you know meaningful decisions throughout the the adventure but they still learn the history of you know uh the, the, the Tiger of Kai coming up through Shinano and, and kind of taking over and and there's some things that they that the characters have to wrestle with and that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Now, given the fact that there's a bunch of different branching paths that can potentially be taken, with with the branching paths, first off, was the goal for that to make it so that each time the each time the adventure is run, it's not it's not always going to go down the same way. I wouldn't I wouldn't call it it's it's more like uh, branching paths that come back together. Um, All so roads that, lead you know, to Rome. Uh, kind of. I mean, you, you, chapter you have to get from chapter one to chapter two to chapter three, and those things you know those chapters start in the same way. Um, but how you finish things out and the choices you make along the way um, kind of make it so that, you know, everything might branch out, but then those things come back together uh, I, at the beginning think, of the next chapter. I think you put it really well one time, Corey, when we were talking about it, where you said, look, this since this is, this is historical fiction, right? So history happened. So this is going to happen. This next thing is going to happen. You're living it, so how are you going to behave in this history, right? So, well, the characters do have decisions to make that can affect the adventure, right? And but like Corey said, you know, 
the next thing is still going to happen. Like they're probably not gonna, you know, no GM is gonna let them go and say kill Takeda Shingen. Mm-hmm. If they did, great, your adventure's over. Have right, because <laughs> the rest of this book doesn't matter. <laughs> right. So history is still gonna happen, uh, but to some extent, yeah, you could have a di- a pretty different adventure each time. And at the same time, history still happens. So once you've played it through once, you kind of know what's going to happen at the end, right? Um, so from that aspect, it, there is an infinite replayability uh, because uh, of the fact that it's still is just it's based in history. Yeah, and, and I would say that you know I don't know a module out there that has a lot of replayability. Even really sandbox modules like Water Deep, Water Deep Dragon Heist. Um, you play through it once, maybe twice, and you know too much of the story to play it again. I think the only one that people play multiple people play multiple times is Tomb of Horrors, and that's because everybody keeps wiping. Right. <laughs> it's it's not that they it's not that it, it's not infinitely replayable. It's just too hard to get through in one with one right. party. I um, just want to keep trying until they can actually finish it. Well, it's this. Well. Well, it's it's no di- it's no different than the than the persistence that's rewarded with a Souls like game. Yeah, like Dark Souls. Yeah. Uh, I'm not go. I am not by any stretch of the imagination going to say that Tomb of Horrors is the Dark Souls of D and D. Anyone who think anyone who thinks I'm going to go down that route, I want you to spe- I want you to expose yourselves now so I can figure out. Who I who I put on the stocks and have tomatoes thrown at them? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm I I, I could have sworn that's what you said. <laughs> I mean, that's what I heard. <laughs> so, I, I, and and that's the other thing is is uh, the and I'll I'll just put it out there. This adventure is is not your crunchy D and D adventure. If you want something challenging where you have to build a character and min max and, and that's, then this may not be for you. This is not, this is more of a, a historical fiction, a story through history um, where you have a lot of character agency to live in that time and to make some decisions. And, and yeah, there are combat encounters and uh, they're not, they're not easy combat encounters. Um, Matter of fact, I, I think we had to tone down one of the encounters in chapter two because in our playtesting, we we had to do a lot of hand waving to get through the rest of the playtest yeah. because of uh yeah. because of that that encounter. And I, James knows the one I'm talking about, but I, I don't want to give it away. So, and with that with that in mind, when it comes to when it came to enca- when it came to encounters, are you are you setting up maps within the Within the book, or are you leaning more into theater of the mind? Uh, no, we we do have some maps that that are going to come with it. Uh, now they're not hex maps. They're um, are not. I mean, they're not five foot square maps. They're probably going to be um, unless you're doing the 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 larger map version or the larger map uh, backer reward. It's going to be basically the uh, basic two two pages. Um, what is that? Eight and a half by seventeen, or something like that. I, yep. Or eleven by seventeen. That's what it's. That's what it is. Eleven by seventeen. And given given the cho- given the choice options, have you guys considered putting in a? I guess I guess a campaign. I guess a campaign sheet for the for the GM so that some of those decisions can be tracked. Um, t- tell me more. What do you mean? It's some of the decisions can be tracked. Um, I'm operating under the assumption that there are certain junction point decisions thro- throughout the throughout the advent throughout the adventure when it comes when it comes to things like the role play cards and and the like. And right because of those moving parts, I was curious if you guys had considered putting in a sheet in the back for the GM where he can. Tra- where you can track the players' decisions at those junction points to keep everything on the same page. So um, we could, but I think that because 
because we use the cards, the players have that. Um, meaning that this is the card I gave out. The player has, and it's more on the players to use those um, that information and that the, the the things that have changed based on the cards that they got. Um, so I guess I, I I feel like we offloaded that to the players. Um, is that part of the storytelling so that, you know, because they have it in front of them. They can, hey, remember I talked to so-and-so at the village and I have this thing. Okay, well, let's use it then. Let's let's use that bit of information in this next scene. Um, whereas the, the, the Game Master doesn't really have to track all that stuff. The, the stuff that the Game Master has to track is all the NPCs, their motivations, uh, and really get to know what, what's what is possible uh, based on what the players do. Um, but it's it's not as hard and fast as like a uh, choose your own adventure book where, you know, turn to page 62 or turn to page 48. Okay, which way did we go? It It's not, it's not that, uh, um, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's not that, because it like we were saying earlier. It isn't the tumbleweed. Correct. Yes. I, I, every decision matters, mm -hmm. but like we were talking about earlier, history still happens. The story still moves. This the the things that happen on a larger scale still happen, and you're trying to provide as a game master uh, a way for players to experience the the history, experience the world, and the things that they chose. They have in front of them. They know that they know their part of that that story. Um, and it's just not on hard, fast rails like now this happens, then this happens, then that happens. Uh, you get to kind of explore it through these scenes and each choice they make opens up some kind of scene that you could do with them. Uh, but then the next chapter still brings them back to, okay, now you're in the, you're, you know, you're at this castle and this thing is happening at the castle and we have to deal with this thing happening at the castle um no matter how we got there mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah um it, it's kind of like the 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 history is parallel to the story it's not like the history is driving the story the history is happening and it's parallel to all the stuff the characters get into along the way if mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah i can see i can see where you're going at with that now I'd like to ask a few things on playtesting experiences. First off, obviously because of the way that this adventure is set up, it would be trickier to ha to have a wipe, but have you had any instances of wipe? Uh, we did not. We actually had an instance where we could have wiped, but because we were at a conference, uh, and, or, a, you know, yeah, we were at a conference and we wanted to see... <laughs> Uh, how they handled all of the story and get feedback on it. So, yeah, that that one we talked about. There was some hand waving that happened during the that encounter, so that they did not wipe, um, so that we could continue on and get feedback on chapter three. But they would have wiped. <laughs> yes. Yep, we definitely hand wove that. Hand wove that. Which I can I can see. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna pass judgment on anybody doing hand waves, because otherwise I would be a massive massive hypocrite. But when it but what would you say were some what would you say with some with some of the big takeaways that you had? Dur um. During the during the initial playtest runs, I'll let you go first on this one, James, because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Could you repeat that? I, I want to wrap my head around it. Um, what were some of the big takeaways in the in the early playtests as far as the le as far as the lessons that you learned from experience? Yeah. So. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, the first, the the, I, the easiest one was that we needed more time. Uh, you know, we we had uh, four hour sessions, and we were able to get through the adventure, but only by cutting out 
every single thing that was completely non-essential. Um, it was we it was very bare bones, um, and we realized that we had a bunch of things that could be fleshed out into, you know, better encounters, more role playing, things like that. But it would have taken a lot longer. Um, we also learned that people loved the character cards. Like that was the single th thing that everybody commented on, mm -hmm. um, and and that they thought that the mechanic itself was brilliant. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, we thought they were good too, but uh, it was nice to see that um, people wanted more uh, of more of the cultural notes and background and things like that. They they liked what they got, but they wanted more. Um, and uh, I think those are kind of the big ones. They wanted more um, maps of the, the area of Japan that it's set in, which is one of the things we're going to be adding into the book. Uh, you know, just more things to make it more immersive, right? If you think about the GUI cube stuff, all the handouts and things like that, that's, they wanted more of things like that. Right, right. And, and the other part of it that we got was... Uh, character main npc artwork and main npc appendix uh was because it's a lot of names that people um if you're you know not familiar with that culture and somebody's throwing out you know names from another culture at you they all run together in your mind and without some kind of handout or some kind of uh, appendix that says you know this is this person and you know giving them a way to keep track of the people. In the early playtesting, that's that's the biggest feedback was it was hard for me to keep track of who is who because of the names. Um, so that was uh, hopefully we're fixing that with having that you know uh, dramatist persona in at the end of the book. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count? for the module? Um, I, 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 I think... It depends on the layout. Yeah, that depends on layout. I think it's probably going to be somewhere around uh, 100 pages. Um, but some of that's going to be the extra stuff um, that, that we're throwing in. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm going to say around 100 pages. Is what is what it looks like at this point, but um, like I said, we're getting together this weekend. I'm going out west. We're gonna try and uh, look at you know the the artwork piece, figure out which wh where where our most important artwork should be, uh, also which parts to further develop, um, and do we develop in line, meaning that okay, chapter one has all of these things. Or do we do, do chapter one like we've got it and then have an appendix of extra things you can do with chapter one? We, those are some decisions we're, we're working on uh, as we meet this weekend. Mm -hmm. And what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Not a date, but a ballpark. Um, February 2023. I, I would love to have it at uh, Genghis Khan, which is our local con uh, here in Denver. Um, that gets get, it's actually where we did uh, majority of the playtesting, and I would love that a year after they saw it there to to have some available. So that's my hope. And I I can certainly get behind that. Oh, just make just make sure to knock on wood after the show, you know, just in case, just in case. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know how there's the saying that there's no atheists in foxholes. I yes. I think I think in the same vein, there's no atheists at a gaming table. <laughs> yeah. And given all these superstitions that people have about their dice, um. I think that validates that particular that particular thing. So that's why I insist on knocking on wood. Yep, yep. And and uh, you know, I I've I've run other small kickstarters um, and the only one that was late on delivery was uh, the Runes and Bones Zero Edition 
which was all handmade. Uh, and it was only 10 days late, and that's because I spent 10 days in the hospital um, with pulmonary embolisms. So I think I, I think my backers gave me that uh, as a, you know, hey, you were in the hospital for 10 days, and you were only 10 days late in delivery. So um, I was okay with yeah, that. We forgave you that. <laughs> we will spare you for now. But... With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. But thanks for having us. Thank you. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>